minutes. <clears throat> How's it going guys? Today's an exciting day because Judy's going to be on, so <laughs> I'm pretty excited. Oh, there she is. Okay. There we go. So it should be going live with Judy right now. Hey! Hey! How are you? I'm good, Sonny. I'm just, we're just figuring out the tech here. Okay, no worries. You got some time. Yeah. Can... Awesome. And so I'm, you want it on landscape, right? That's what, that's what you're on? Yeah, that's what I'm on right now. Okay, so. sounds good. I think we got some good buzz going with, uh, with you attending. So lots of Facebook <laughs> likes and stuff like that. So I'm like, let's see what we can do here. Oh, that's so awesome. I'm sure you're going to see a lot of familiar names that you've Educated oh, at one point. Oh, I just see Brooke join. That's so nice. Yeah, I, here. Oh, nice. I feel like this is going to be an awfully boring um, presentation if they're all my old students. <laughs> yeah. That's so sure. funny. There'll be a bunch of different people, but we can yeah. kind of do whatever That's, we want. I miss, uh, I miss seeing everyone. Oh, there's Jenna. I miss seeing everybody in person. So this is, um, you know. Seeing the names is somewhat satisfying, but not not really. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> how how was the day, Sunny? Are you starting to get yeah, some busier? Some, seeing some clients today. So I had a few in the morning and a few in the afternoon. So it's just a bit of running around because it's just me right now. Oh um, yeah. Oh, so is that right? Okay. We have to spread patients out. Um, so I'm booking like pretty much in half. So Okay. I'll see one in an hour, so that way I have enough time to bill, I have enough time to clean. <laughs> right. And and is the um is the system working okay with the masking yeah. and all that? Yeah. Okay. Oh yeah, it's fine. Like uh, everyone's bringing their most people are bringing their own masks and they're pretty understanding. Yeah. So I yeah. think it's I I'm not too uh, other than my face getting really hot, it's okay. Yeah. Oh. So. Well, you know, it's not as bad as the frontline people that are walking around with the tattoos on their nose, right? Yeah. I feel so bad for those folks. Yeah, it's yeah, it's crazy. And then I know, like, I'll probably do a face shield for some of the TMD cases I work with. Right. Um, right. Other than that, it's pretty. We got a lot. We got enough space. So. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. We just got to kind of get the word out again. And uh, Jenna says hi, Judy. Hope all is. Hi. Isn't that nice? Good. I wanted to first of all thank you for every like for coming on, and then secondly. Thanks for still staying strong as a faculty and, and continuing things. And I'm sure the students are very appreciative of that. I've always been appreciative of you and the faculty. So um, the, hence why like you're a strong motivator of me trying to get back to physio um, and trying to be a role model because you're my role model and my mentor. So Aww. I have a lot of respect for you and I really appreciate your time and you coming on um, and, and Nick and Megan as well. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, first of all, thank you, Sunny, for those nice words. And thank you for, uh, honestly, for inviting me. I, um, you know, I'm, I'm so grounded as a clinician in Edmonton, and I feel really, really proud of, uh, you know, the work that is done in our field in Edmonton. I'm always happy to support. So, yeah. uh, and I miss seeing all my students. I miss seeing patients. And so I think what you're doing is great. And I'm just really pleased to be part of it. Um, oh, we're so, honored. Yeah, well, thank you. I, I feel like we should just stop now. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's going to be downhill from here. <laughs> oh, gosh. Not at all. Not at all. <laughs> anyway, so would you like me to, do, do you think we're good to start, Sunny, or what um, would you like? I think to so, yeah. Yeah, people kind of creep in as, as time goes on, but yeah, we okay. could start, and then we'll put this on on like the our story for 24 hours and i'll upload it onto youtube as well so people yeah can check it out later if they okay yeah people are working sure oh of course yeah and people are certainly getting back to that um so what i'm gonna do is i'm gonna shift the camera so that it's just on the slides now uh, yeah. so i'll, I'll uh, return to you in person uh, you, might have to, you might actually have to use the other camera because it's coming backwards like a mirror oh you mean to switch it 
or like uh, if you have the um, if you turn the phone the other way, like to face. Okay. Oh, I like because right. you probably got two cameras on your phone, right? No. Or no. So if you oh, turn right. it. Oh, hold on. Oh yeah. Oh, so I see that. that. Yeah, there we go. Now it's straight. Yeah. So that that's Megan helping out. Thank goodness I've got two. <laughs> <laughs> Thumbs up. Thanks, Meg. <laughs> so that's good now, Meg? Yeah. Okay. All right. So I'm going to launch in, and um, I'm sorry that I can't see you while I'm talking, um, but I'll try and make my voice as enthusiastic as possible. Um, and so what we're, we're going to do, folks, is we'll, we'll start by just chatting a little bit about the topic today, and then uh, we'll do a, a real quick... Uh, sort of set change and we're gonna uh, run downstairs and um, go through uh, some exercises, all right? And so a little bit of a natural break there. So um, when Sunny had asked me to do this um, and you know asked about sort of potential topics, uh, I, this was one we landed on. And so um, I, I think there's some relevance when we talk about rotator cuff injuries uh, what are they and how do we prevent them? So again, you know, I appreciate there's a, a mixed group today. Uh, I hope that there's some individuals that, uh, uh, you know, are maybe wondering about what rotator cuff injuries are and, uh, you know, how they can prevent them personally. Uh, for my students and my young colleagues, uh, I think that hopefully this, uh, you know, will certainly be a review for you. But uh, maybe just get you thinking a little bit about how we can uh, have a role in the preventative um, part with our patients. So let's launch in. So first of all, just, uh, you know, so we're all on the same page when we're talking about what the rotator cuff is. It's, it's a really interesting part of our shoulder anatomy. It, um, it gets this sort of, uh, you know, importance because of its name but we must remember that it, it really is comprised of four muscles. And so you can see on the slide, um, that is our shoulder blade, we call it the scapula. And the four muscles originate uh, from the scapula. Uh, and uh, you know we don't need to get into too much detail, but there's one that's quite big on the undersurface of the shoulder blade. There's one that sits uh, you know, underneath this bony prominence, another little one there and one there. And what's important is, is uh, all of those muscles come together into a shared tendon. And tendon is the tissue that then attaches to bone. And that's what we've named the cuff. So the tendinous part uh, of all of those four muscles converge together into a common attachment. And that's a really important consideration because as we think about function, just the nature of the anatomy and the cuff coming together with those four individual muscles into one uh, unified tissue allows for its, um, its, its very important function. And those are two things really. So we always remember that of course it creates rotation. So rotation of uh, the ball on the socket, right? So if you think about the shoulder joint, it's easy to imagine um, that that is a ball and socket joint. So the humerus is the ball and the scapula is the socket. Um, but probably more important is its role as a stabilizer. And so because of that anatomy we just talked about, it has that great ability to kind of grab onto that ball and really to almost like a steering mechanism or stabilize it in the center of that socket. And uh, so it is, it is our most important, what we call dynamic stabilizer. So we get a lot of stabilization in our joints from our ligaments and you know, those other tissues that are kind of the connective tissue in our body. But uh, the muscles create such an important um, part of that stabilizing and the cuff is the big one in the shoulder. And I, I always like to put this picture in uh, because I think it's very telling if you look here this is really what the ball and socket looks like. So, so you can see that the ball really outsizes the socket. And so the importance of that stabilization from tissue like the, uh, like the rotator cuff is, is essential for normal function. And so this is kind of the depressing slide, but um, really important that we remember uh, that shoulder pain is one of the most common complaints that we see in the musculoskeletal system up to about a half of the population experiences at least one episode of shoulder pain a year. And of that, about 50% of that involves the rotator cuff. 
And so there's a lot of studies in the States that uh, look at these big, uh, we call them epidemiology studies that uh, track injury incidents um, in different areas. And, you know, the stats are staggering that about 6 million people in the U.S. have what we call atraumatic rotator cuff related pain. So that's pain that didn't come from sort of this one grand episode that, um, that injured it. It's just these things that sort of come on uh, over time. And the other thing to remember with cuff injuries is they're, they're common across the ages. So we'll see a lot of our uh, patients um, that are young and especially people that are working in overhead positions, whether that's athletes or workers, but uh, this is an injury or a disease that affects our aging shoulders. And so we'll see, you know, really high incidence in um, individuals, I say greater than 65, but the, the other bad news is our cuff starts to kind of wear down uh, really in our 30s and our 40s. So another kind of very pronounced stat that we always talk about is that about 10 to 40 percent of the U.S. population over that age of 60 has a rotator cuff tear. And um, that word tear is awfully scary. So I want you to just remember uh, that tears in the cuff, if you kind of imagine that anatomy again, those tears can be little tiny, like imagine an old blanket that has, you know, sort of little wear and tear uh, and threads, you know, think of your old baby blanket that started to wear out. Uh, that's sort of what we start to see in these degenerative cuffs. Uh, but it, it happens. And, you know, we can't guarantee everything, but we can certainly guarantee that we're all going to get older. So the aging rotator cuff is an important consideration uh, for us as professionals, as physios, but also as a population. And I also want to draw your attention to the, <clears throat> excuse me, the stat underneath that, that um, reminds us that of that huge population of individuals that have this degenerative tearing in their cuff, less than 5% get surgery. So that means that greater than 95% of people are not getting surgery. And that's a really important message for my physio friends in the audience, that this is a condition, a disease that is uh, certainly going to present to your um, to your clinics and to your caseloads. Uh, and in a minute, I'll tell you if you don't already know that. But we're very good and very effective at managing these. So this is a big population. And then, as we said, the, the rotator cuff disease progresses over time, becomes more painful, and involves more muscles. So now that I've cheered you all up. Uh, let's delve into some of the causes. So what happens to the cuff that we see this high incidence of injury? So again, circling back to that anatomy and the function, it, it's actually fairly easy when you think about that to imagine how the cuff starts to, um, you know, be prone to injury. Uh, we talked about that you can have that one episode where you, let's say you fall um, or you have uh, one dramatic sort of mechanism, um, you know, with sort of overthrowing if you're playing ball or anything like that. So you can have that one episode, we call that traumatic. More commonly, it's what we call atraumatic. So people will notice their shoulder starts to get sore and maybe starts to get um, a little bit dysfunctional and uh, it can't really nail it down to one thing. There's just a whole bunch of things. We know for causal factors that they're often uh, intertwined. So overuse, I mean, that, that cuff in our shoulders is a really busy tissue because it helps to stabilize. It's always on. So the firing of the cuff, uh, you know, is something that as soon as you start using your arm, it has to uh, participate. So there's a lot of overuse and overload. So you can have overload just from, you know, thinking of doing something more uh, with a greater capacity uh, than you're normally used to. Compression, you may be, um, if you're a patient, you maybe have heard uh, someone talk about impingement. We're um, not going to get into details on that, but we kind of have broadened that conversation to talking more about compression. And it's easy to see, this isn't a great slide, but you can see just with how the cuff, which is the white part, has to travel in and around lots of other tissue. These are ligaments, there's a bursa there, there's lots of bony tissue. And so it's prone to a lot of that compressive um, type of force just from other tissue being around it. And then we've talked quite a lot about just age and degeneration, that those are just phenomena that definitely play into rotator cuff injuries. 
So what are the injuries? So you can certainly have a strain of the muscle part, so the muscle being the red and then the tendon being the white. Um, more commonly with rotator cuff, it is at the tendon part of that tissue. Uh, and you can have just a straight inflammatory reaction where you truly have overdone it. Um, we will have those tears. And again, I'll just remind you that that can be a very wide spectrum from something that's fairly uh, minor, uh, what we would say is a partial low grade tear right up until a full tear. And that also can um, you know, be distinguished between if it's one part of that rotator cuff or all four. Uh, so there's lots of details or subgroups underneath tears. And then of course, mechanical compression, we've talked about that. Some people may uh, call that impingement. And then of course, aging and degeneration, that's certainly not, we certainly wouldn't <laughs> talk about aging and degeneration as the injury, but it's um, you know an, an aging cuff phenomenon. So the, today's talk is gonna be really to try and prevent injuries, but I, I do want to, in case um, there's anyone with us today that has a rotator cuff injury, I, I just feel like I want to uh, spend one slide just talking very over overview uh, kind of principle here on treatment. And so the first thing I'll just say is that um, when we look at individuals who have had injuries to the cuff, the, the rehab programs are very active and they're effective in the large majority of patients. And so, you know, what we mean when we say it's an active rehab um, principle is it's exercise based. So it's a combination of doing uh, mobility, strengthening, functional retraining, you know, that might be supplemented uh, by some hands-on or some needling or different types of modalities. Uh, but you always, always will be approaching your shoulder rehab um, with a very active approach. And that's just the nature of the shoulder. It is controlled primarily by muscle. Uh, and so we really in fixing uh, an unhappy shoulder, we've got to get after that. So it's, and, and I think this is really positive because patients, um, you know, can really take a, a, a great responsibility in their management of the shoulder. Uh, and we end up being, in a lot of cases, kind of coaches uh, throughout the process. So I, I think it's a very positive approach. Uh, you should know that it doesn't um, tend to fix itself quickly. So I like to tell patients it's a, probably about a minimum three months from the start to finish that you really feel like, yeah, I'm there. Uh, sometimes, depending on the severity of the injury, it can take longer. So, so um, you know, it's certainly not a quick fix, but it's a good fix. So it does require commitment, <laughs> compliance, and adherence. And so, again, just to give you a little bit of uh, our statistical data, we do know from very big studies that, you know, 75% of patients, and these are the ones with those tears, so something a little bit more significant, at five years, manage well without surgery, okay? So we do have these sort of long outcome studies now that are showing some very good management um, of patients who have had rehab, okay? We did a study um, just recently that tried to look a little bit at that question as well um, relative to, you know, of patients with cuff problems that present to us, what's the proportion that, um, I guess that do very well with rehab and what's the proportion that really do end up having surgery. And so it was a, it was a fairly small study in the grand scheme. So only about 143 participants, but you'll see that of that only 11%, and again, these were cuff tears needed to have surgery, uh, that that meant 78% were successfully managed with rehab. So the message is, is if you have a rotator cuff injury, treatment works, it's a good approach. Go see your, um, your physio, your uh, health professional, and get yourself better because there's very good hope. So now if we shift to um, you know, what we really want to focus on now, uh, that being what is the best way to treat rotator cuff injuries. So I'll let you pop an idea into your head on that. Um, and then I'll answer with this sort of smug answer, which is to prevent them from happening. And uh, I realize that that's uh, kind of a smart aleck response, but the truth is we don't, we don't probably dig into this as much as we should. Um, I think that in the, uh, in the knee and the ankle and, and certainly in the back, um, you know, and Brandon at Pursuit is doing some good work uh, looking at this. Um, we've, we've really taken some good steps forward to look at preventative type of 
programs and um, uh, I think we need to be doing a little bit more in the shoulder. So having said that, when we do look at rotator cuff injury prevention, uh, this is really the model that we always would want to uh, kind of attach ourselves to, isn't it? That you think about our biggest role should be this prevention and early recognition. And then if that's not happened, then we certainly want to try and intervene early. And if we can do those two first uh, steps really well, then you know, the actual treatment of those um, you know, injuries that are full blown should be smaller. And I, I know this is tough and this is a big philosophical discussion, but I, I really think that if we could move towards um, looking a little bit more at shoulder prevention and just good shoulder health, I think that we'd be able to shift that. And we have to do this because um, one thing we do know is, is uh, shoulder injuries become chronic. So they become recurrent. They, you know, patients will talk about having a bad shoulder, like it's, uh, you know, part of their existence. And uh, uh, we do know that there's a recurrence. So we want to try and intervene as early as possible to prevent this. And so we all know, the physios in the group, that if you can intervene with somebody who has just minor changes around that shoulder um, region, we, we can definitely, um, you know, change things quicker and without all the other compensation patterns that tend to come in. And, you know, on a, on a buy-in level, early intervention results in less time away from work or play and shorter rehab periods. So, you know, perhaps a shift in uh, how we manage this and getting out into the public a bit more. So we'd like to be able to change that. And if we look at what a rotator cuff injury prevention program would be, it probably follows some of the, the same philosophies or principles that we would um, use in treating uh, a shoulder patient. And really they fall into kind of three big categories. The first being neuromuscular training, which is really looking at uh, how our muscles work. Uh, shoulder girdle mobility, which is simply just good movement around the shoulder. And then the kinetic chain. I'm, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about these um, in a second, but uh, these are the three. And so we know from looking at injury prevention that if you're someone that's listening to this and you want to think about how do I prevent these you know, high incidence um, injuries that happen in the shoulder, we, we know very well, we can't ask you to be doing tons and tons. Um, and we want to also make sure that programs can be integrated well into your existing life or your existing uh, fitness programs. And so I, I think that if you look at this, if we just frame our um, general shoulder workouts, trunk workouts to tweak them a little bit so we can look at things like that musculature on the shoulder blade, we really should all be looking at some sort of rotator cuff isolated strength exercises. We have to keep our shoulders mobile um, if we start to lose movement in our shoulders, we start to really see a breakdown. And we'll talk more about that. And then the kinetic chain. So let, let's start, uh, talk first of all about the kinetic chain. And so this is a, a concept that, um, you know, really is, is very sensible. When you think about how the body functions, um, it, it works as a unit in performance, right? So when we go to uh, do something maybe as complicated as pitch, uh, as you see in this picture, or something as simple as reaching for something overhead uh, off the cupboard in your kitchen, there is a sequence of events that happens throughout the whole body to allow that endpoint, that functional endpoint to occur. In other words, either to release the ball or to grab that coffee cup. Um, and so we have to remember that, that when we um, have an injury, we also will see sometimes this breakdown in those other parts of the kinetic chain. And so as physios, we're, we spend a lot of time trying to really look at, so what are those other parts of the chain that support good shoulder health? Uh, and then if somebody has been unfortunate to actually have an injury, what are some of those other parts that maybe contributed to that injury? Or, um, you know, again, we can look to uh, get healthier to support that injured area. So that, hopefully I didn't lose you on that. Um, but really, it's just this idea about looking beyond the shoulder and in the healthy shoulder. So now if we're looking towards that model, of how do we keep our shoulders healthy? We know with the kinetic chain 
one of the most important um, parts of that is to keep the uh, spine adjacent. So think about your upper back, your thoracic spine, your neck, your C-spine, and your lower back. So that's the most adjacent tissue, uh, or part of your anatomy to the shoulder girdle. That has to be as strong and mobile as possible, okay? And, and there's no question you can say with great authority that a stronger trunk equals a stronger shoulder. And so that's an important buy-in for our patients. It may or may not also be um, important to bring in the lower extremities. So you think about the pitcher as an example here. You can quite well imagine that the output of throwing that ball is highly uh, correlated or has that strong relationship to how strong the lower extremity is, as well as the amount of movement they have in, say, the hips. So uh, you know, this is, this is the fun stuff where we start to go a little bit beyond. So that's kinetic chain. And so the next big thing would be this idea of neuromuscular. So um, the scapula, remember shoulder blade, we want to always think about that being strong and mobile. And I've kind of taken to calling this area uh, the upper core because it's a lot more um, you know, fancy than saying just scapular stabilization exercises. Those don't, those don't really excite patients. So I kind of talk about this as the upper core um, because this area in here, which supports, again, the shoulder blade, is, is really key. And so remember that that scapula functions as a bridge between the upper limb, which is going to happen here, and really the rest of the trunk and the body. It's also where all of the rotator cuff muscles originate from. So we talked about that way back. And so you want the muscles um, that support this important part of our shoulder to be super strong and efficient so that the cuff that lives on the shoulder blade and then extends to our shoulder joint can have the most efficient, optimal environment. Um, so there's a whole bunch of muscles that attach around that. The, the trap is probably one that you're very familiar with. And so there's the three parts of the trap that we like to really focus on. There's some other fancy ones called your serratus and some deeper muscles um, like levator and rhomboid. If you're interested, you can certainly have a little bit of a deep dive on those. But those are all muscles that we, uh, we would want to have very healthy to support good shoulder health. And then the rotator cuff. So we, we always, I mean, I'm such a believer in this, that our programs uh, at the gym, at home, in rehab, they always have to involve the cuff. Even if, even if you don't have an identified injury to the cuff, but your shoulder's bugging you, the cuff is central to a healthy shoulder. So um, if you have a patient that's got uh, a problem with their shoulder, there's, there's really no reason why the cuff uh, isn't part of those programs. It will help. We must remember that the cuff um, functions as a mover and a stabilizer. So we want to think about it in both ways. As a mover, it, um, you know, most simply works to rotate uh, the, the shoulder in and out. So internal and external rotation. And on this slide, I, you know, I've got a whole bunch of pictures and you can sit and take a look at them if, you, um, if you'd like. But the idea is that you know, we can progress from, this would be a pretty basic one that you maybe have done where your arm's at your side. Um, even this has gone a little bit more interesting by having the patient sitting on a ball, which is gonna challenge lower core a bit more. Um, this individual is doing a little bit of um, uh, kind of higher level balance to try and have that uh, individual hold. So there's different ways you can certainly modify. So uh, I do like the good old boring, um, this position as a starter, but we never want to stop there. We always want to make sure we're, we're going into different positions. We're going into challenging more of the core, you know, getting into using different equipment, different um, trunk positions. So, uh, but bottom line is we want to think about the cuff as a, as a tissue to strengthen. And then remember its role as a stabilizer. And so if you think, well, how do I train it as a stabilizer? Really, whenever we use our shoulder, we are firing the cuff. But we know that if we do things that compress through the joint, which we call closed chain activities, think of something like a push-up, that as soon as you compress through the shoulder joint, your cuff fires and it can uh, really be a nice position. So doing those sort of weight-bearing activities uh, can be very helpful and healthy for our cuff.
Shoulder mobility, so really think of two things here. We wanna keep the joint moving, so we want just that good range of motion. Um, and we want to make sure that the soft tissue that is around the shoulder is uh, got lots of extensibility or flexibility. So there's few muscles that tend to get tight. Uh, pec minor at the front of your shoulder. We're going to go through an exercise or a stretch for that. Your lats. This is a great just your child's pose is a great stretch for lats. And um, the the back part of the shoulder. So your actual rotator cuff as it comes from that shoulder blade, kind of goes deep into the shoulder, it actually can get quite tight. And um, so this, pos this position where we're doing a cross flexion uh, is a good general stretch to do, but there's, um, there's an important component to that that you wanna think about that we'll go through. And then we, we must always remember this. So when we think about doing anything that has a goal of increasing mobility, we always want to think about doing that with control. So the idea of, you know, just doing range of motion uh, or stretching without some control work, which is strength uh, to support that movement, it doesn't make sense. So always remember mobility and control live together. Okay, and so now we are going to, um, I, Sunny, is it okay if we head downstairs or should I pause for questions at this point? Um, we could probably do the exercises first and then do questions later. That way we just get it through it all. Yeah. Okay, yeah. that sounds good. So we're, we're going to uh, head downstairs. And um, uh, so just give me a sec. I think we're good to go. This will be a little clunky, guys, but uh, maybe go get, get a glass of water. Yes, hydration. Right. Okay, Megs, do you want to take this? Yes. yes. All right. Or if everyone has like bands and stuff at home, try this stuff out as we do oh. it. Yeah, you um, betcha. Sunny, Sunny, are you going to do it too? I'll do as much as I can for sure, which is okay. everything. <laughs> My shoulders okay. have some issues, so. Oh, okay. Sounds good. So I, I've now enlisted a third person. My son's going to help with the, um, with the videoing on this. Um, so just so everybody knows, uh, we all live together, so uh, I'm not breaking any physical distancing rule, rules here. Okay, so Megan, come on up and uh, let's pop on the bed here. So for this, Nick, we just really wanna see all of Megan's trunk here. Okay? And Sunny, just shout out if I'm doing something wrong, okay? Oh, you're, you're the master, so. <laughs> okay, well, what I mean is more with the tech if, if, I'm, if I'm missing something here. Okay. Um, okay, so you have seen, cause I know I've followed some of Sunny's uh, talks. You've seen, I think it was, uh, um, Brandon that went through and did the cat and cow. I love this position. If we're thinking about our kinetic chain and core, we talked about how we want to make sure the spine is as uh, mobile and strong as possible. Uh, cat and cow is great. So Megan, if you don't mind just going into uh, just a sequence of the cat and cow. So this obviously, she has no issues with mobility. <laughs> um, and so that is a nice arch in the lower back. We're actually getting some arch in here. So that's really good. And now go into the cat. And so again, this is really important to get some mobility in both directions. So you can use cat and cow, which you maybe are doing in yoga or different um, activities. Really, really good. Keeps the spine mobile. The other area that we want to always think about is your uh, upper back, because this is a real, real contributing uh, problem with shoulder stuff. So let's do that next one, Megan, where we are going to work on doing um, an exercise, a really nice one to try and increase that rotation in the shoulder. And so you can see that as Megan goes into this position, we're getting a really nice, we're turning to the right. You wanna try and keep this nice and tight if you can. And then as she comes up, <laughs> good. Good, so that's good. And again, we want some good stability here. And then you can do the thread the needle, which some of you might know, which is just going to extend it a little bit further into that rotation. Um, so again, that's just a way. I kind of like keeping the arm like that for uh, the up phase because I think it protects the shoulder a little bit, but that's also really, really good. Now, another one, uh, because we do have a problem with a lot of, you can just lay on your back on this one. We do have uh, a lot of problems in that shoulder region and being really tight in that upper back. And so just laying on a bolster or taking a towel and rolling it up um, and putting it right down the center of your spine is great. 
And so just the nature of the position is going to put her into a little bit of an uh, extended position through especially that upper back. If we want to accentuate it, I'll ask Megan to just put her arms almost in kind of a W position. And just, I'm going to jump ahead here because this is a really good reminder for our shoulder mobility that if we're in this kind of open book or W position, that there's a muscle at the front, your pec minor, that gets a really nice stretch here. And so this is a, I love this position. I think a lot of patients do too. They find it really quite comfortable, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, good. Now let's get you safely off of there. And so the other thing I'm actually not going to spend time on, but I wanted to mention is your core strength. And so actually go onto your hands and knees. So I imagine, you know, you've probably learned or you will learn uh, we, we know tons and tons of different types of uh, core strength exercises. Things like the, the, this position, which we call the bird dog. Well, go ahead, Megan. So get a real nice fire there. And so hands and, and legs functioning at the same time. The idea is to keep the strength here as best you can. Um, and so I would just say as a, as a comment that your strength in your core is crucial. So um, please make sure that that's part of it. Okay, excellent. So pop off there, and we're gonna go on to, I'm gonna pull this up for a sec. And let's go over here. So uh, Nick, we're gonna do a little bit of rolling. Okay, so we talked about the, let's set you up for this one. Um, good. And so I think you can see a little bit from here. That would be awesome. Mm -hmm. So with the shoulder blade strength, we want to again target that whole traps. So you want to think about your upper traps, your middle traps, your lower traps. If this is a preventative program, uh, we're not going to be thinking about, like we do in a rehab environment, targeting certain ones because somebody has an injury or sort of some uh, pathology there. So as a rule, if you're going to do good rowing, I'm going to tell you, I think you should be doing all of them. So the mid row, uh, go ahead, Megan, and just let her rip. Okay. And just keep going. So the emphasis always on good core. So this is nice and tight. And thinking about leading with the blade. So let's make sure that's that's better. So this has to fire first. You want to always think about moving the center out. So good core, good stability, good posture, shoulder blades, and then arms. Good. So now uh, let's do the overhead. So you can do a little bit more of an overhead row, and this is going to target a little bit lower down. Okay, so again, nice core, thinking about the shoulder blades coming down a little bit now. This works really well on a lap pull-down machine too, so if you're at the gym. Okay, good, and then you can do an upward row, and you call those, actually from here, Nick, from the green one, oh, um, you call those Facebook, so Nick, uh, no, 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 we don't, okay. <laughs> Okay, and so, to, yeah, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, so I actually want you more like a shrug, Megan. So I'm gonna set up oh. a bent over row. So I'm gonna get you to stand up. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. And so this is gonna work a little bit more of your upper traps and your levator. Good. And you can actually bring your elbows in a little bit more. So it's just yeah, that's it. Mm -hmm. Good. So again, all we've done is by changing where the tube is, which is super easy to do at home, is we've changed the focus from you know, which part of that important shoulder stabilizer we're, um, shoulder blade stabilizer we're targeting. Good stuff. So, um, the other sequence that you want to think about, if I pop you back onto the bed and put your head here, is push-ups, okay? Oh. And so with the shoulder blade, don't go in until I tell you, but with the um, shoulder blade muscles, there's <laughs> muscles that kind of wrap around here um, called your serratus that is very easy to tie into what you're doing with your, uh, with your push-up program. So on the push-up, what I want you to do is remember that push-up with a plus. So at the top, you'll see Megan doesn't just stop here, but she goes a little bit further. And you'll see that upper rounding here. So let's just have you demonstrate that. Good. And so here's the important. There, that's what you want even more. Got it, girl. Now be careful it's not all from here. Do you want more? That's it. So we're getting that nice sort of extension of blades, and that's going to pull in serratus. Okay, good. Now, the other thing that you're probably doing that, again, I just want to draw your attention to is something like a plank. 
So a plank um, works really, really nicely for sort of a, that upper area. So you can get somebody doing their plank and then actually just thinking about, nope, not from here, just from here. Think about the brain pulling that together, head up a little bit. Good. And so you can target different muscles. So again, just an awareness that with things like planks, again, we're getting that nice weight bearing <laughs> compression, <laughs> that, um, <laughs> compression through the shoulder. So that's firing the cuff, but we're again targeting that upper back. Okay. So I think that was the things I wanted with the scapula. So now let's move on to the cup. So let's go to the green tube again, all right? And set you up for your two cup exercises. And um, so with the cup, we have an external and an internal rotation. And this is a very basic exercise that you uh, either have done or you've prescribed if you're a physio. Keep the wrist straight, tuck that elbow in, excellent posture. Keep the shoulder blade back, don't arch your back. Just all those things. <laughs> yeah. It's a lot to think about. So, so this is a good exercise. Make sure you're staying at 90. You have to be really picky with patients on it. And um, if you're doing it, you have to be very picky yourself. So be, I always say, go for gold with these exercises. Don't cheat yourself with the effectiveness. This is a very good basic exercise. It's basic, but it's a good way for you to monitor how your shoulder health is. Um, you know, once a week, just do it to fatigue and just make sure you're still getting the same numbers. You turn around. You can do internal rotation as well. Take a big step out. It's really? quite a bit easier. Yeah, because it's a lot easier. Oh, okay. Um, and you can come in as well if you want to complement the rotation. The other thing to think about, remember on the slides, you can do this multiple ways, sitting on a ball. You can change um, you know, the resistance, certainly the volume. Uh, I also would have patients do it at different ranges. So we would perhaps put something like a ball here. We'd have to change the resistance point so it would be further down and then have, oh, this is internal. Anyway, we, we'll take it. But we would have Megan pivoting and you can see that now she's into more of a shoulder abduction position because you know where we're going. We want to get into more of a 90 degree external rotation. So let's do that external rotation press exercise that, that you love. Megan did have some cuff issues, so she's going through this. Uh, anyway, so you can see she's in a nice, almost like a lunge position. So we're getting some nice extension through the hips there. We can still engage that core. And so the tube is now attached low. So step number one is to bring it back to that shoulder height. Good, really engage that shoulder blade. And now externally rotate, watch your wrist. And now take the arm up towards the ceiling. So this is a really nice, and now come back just as slow. Good, unrotate, and then back it goes to the attachment. Do one more time. Watch your blade. Good. So this is this is quite advanced, uh, but it's certainly a really good exercise. So depending on where you're entering in, that's good, huh? Uh, with your strength of your cuff, you know, you might need a little bit of advice on what the most appropriate rotator cuff exercise is. You might also do, let's get you laying oh, on no. your side, <laughs> another fan favorite. Oh, okay, so we'll get you facing that way. And um, so this is uh, another way you can do the cuff that's more of a weight. So we'll just get your elbow on there. I forgot to get the smaller weights from upstairs. So this is a five pounds. This is a lot, just so you know, for doing these exercises. So I'm not gonna have you do very much, but you can do these in a sideline position. Again, arm is at the side, elbows bent to 90. You still wanna have good positioning. And then what you can do is just have the arm come up into external rotation and then slowly down. And you can change your timing on this as you see fit. I won't make Meg do this, but you can also go into a plank position in this position, or you can go from your knees just on a plank. I know, you're not getting paid enough. <laughs> okay. It's a little squishy, but you can do it. And so you could, if you want to bring in more core, you can certainly do the same thing into a little bit more challenged position. Good stuff, okay. Excellent. So that's kind of what I have for cuff. 
And then the last thing I want to talk about is mobility. So you can actually stay seated on the bed. So I'm just using a ski pole, but anything you have at home that it is not super heavy, that has some uh, length to it, works really well. And again, there's lots of different options for doing this as well. So if you keep your elbows straight and just take nice and slow arms all the way up towards the ceiling. So make sure, especially as we get older, that we don't lose this range. So something, we'll just do that repeatedly. Um, something that just make sure that you're taking your arms up into those zones. Amazingly, we don't always exist in those top ranges. And so we wanna be careful that we're keeping the range of motion uh, as healthy as possible. You could keep holding on. You could start here and then do the same thing kind of at a diagonal. So it doesn't really matter as long as you're doing something to maintain range. You could also, from here, just go keep your elbows as locked as you can, side to side. <laughs> well, that's probably not the right technique, but sure. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the thing is, is the shoulder moves in all sorts of positions. So you, you want to duplicate that as much as possible. But this is using something like a, a stick, golf club, ski, will work really, really well. Okay. Now, uh, do you want to go into child's So, yeah. So child's pose is, again, one of those great positions you maybe are already doing. If you're not, and certainly if you have any shoulder issues or you're just kind of getting into the time of your life where you want to protect your shoulder, this is a really nice position. Certainly going to stretch your lats. You can also kind of inch your arms a little bit to one side and the other, and then that's going to cause even more stretch. Go the other way onto that one sides, so a little bit more preferential stretching. Um, so this one I like a lot. It's also a really nice way to kind of encourage some extension in the thoracic spine again. Okay, have a seat on the bed. Um, now, remember yesterday we were talking about this sort of cross body. So just uh, just show me that uh, stretch. And this is one of the game folks you might be quite familiar with. Um, I think a lot of us would think of this as maybe a tricep stretch, which it certainly can be. It's also causing uh, a bit of a stretch to the back part of the shoulder, which is that uh, back part of your cuff, which is really important. But there's a, a very important consideration. And so just unlock a little bit. And so what I want you to do this time, Megan, is before you take that arm across, sit up nice and straight, bring the blade back just a touch. Don't force it, but just a touch. And now try and take it across. And so you'll immediately see that she can't go as far. And so that's because we brought the shoulder blade back a little bit and um, we're not allowing the whole shoulder blade to kind of go when we stretch. That's important because if we're trying to stretch the back part of the shoulder uh, and those cuff muscles, then I have to take the origin of those muscles, which is the shoulder blade, and I have to pull it back a little bit. Okay, so that's a really important consideration. So this is a good stretch, but you have to do it properly. If you're trying to do it for triceps, have at it, doesn't matter. But if you're trying to create a little bit of a stretch here, you have to position the blades back a bit, okay? And now the last one I wanna show you, I'm gonna come into the door here next, so come forward. And Megan, I want you like that. So I know this is a very commonly done stretch for pec major and you can certainly do it for pec minor. I want you to be careful if you have any inkling of shoulder pain that you're not doing this by just kind of leaning in and stretching <laughs> and stretching the front part of the shoulder joint. When you do this, if you're going to do it properly, tuck in here so you're not protected. Shoulder blades back a little bit and then slowly move forward. That's going to stretch the muscle and protect the shoulder. Okay, but this is a very, very good exercise, easy to do. You can do it with the elbows here. You can come up and now you're changing what part of that chest muscle you're stretching, but same thing, you're gonna do it carefully. And then of course you can take it a little bit higher. Good, and same thing, protect the shoulders and off we go. Okay, sounds good. Okay, so um, come on back in Nick. And um, so Sunny, that was all I had for exercises. So I think I'll just uh, kind of allow for questions now, if that's what we'd like. That's great. I got a good warm up, so. 
<laughs> did you do them too? I did all of them. You didn't see me? Yeah, thanks. <laughs> no, I didn't. I didn't. I was so focused on my patient. <laughs> so that, no, that's great. <laughs> thank you. What do I want to do? Okay, you can hold it. That was great. Thank you, thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, she's okay, gotten yeah. lots of practice. My goodness, between uh, yeah. the, all of my uh, videos having to go, or all my teaching having to go onto videos, those those two have been kind of lifesavers for me. So anyway, so yeah. So what, what can I help uh, clear up? <laughs> I'm okay. Like I, I like quite a few of those things. Some things I'll add on to for sure. Yeah. Well, and that's the other thing, I guess maybe I'll just remind you that um, when we talk about sort of a prevention program, and again, as if, if I'm talking to the physios in the group is we have to find um, opportunities to do this. When we most often see patients that have uh, a shoulder problem, they've already come to us with, pathology or some sort of disease and in that case those core groups of exercises shouldn't have used the word core but those different groups of exercises will absolutely be catered to what's best so there's a lot of modifications and and things and there's a, a million different exercises um, so just you know again remember if you're a patient and you and you've seen this and you think wow I wasn't doing it like that that may be because that's not suitable for you so just a grain of salt there Okay, yeah, thanks. I know that I was just getting heckled here. Brandon was saying, Sunny, dying on this one. I don't know what exercise that is. You hear, had some oh. need to work on that core. Buddy. Oh, no. I, I'm going to, now I'm going to have to go back and watch it. <laughs> yes, I will have it up. I'll, I'll highlight the area that I was weak in. <laughs> <laughs> it's always great to see yourself on video, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> and then Shane says, I feel like I'm back in Corb Corbett. Oh. oh. Um, and then we have one, <laughs> Mr. Shane Glassmith. Um, oh. We have one question. How would you modify the core exercises, plank and side plank with a patient who has some shoulder instability? Ah, really good. So um, you'll, you'll be actually pleasantly surprised to know that people that have instability really, really do well and, and like doing things in a closed chain position. Because if you think about it, what you've done by putting them into that weight bearing position is you've actually created a, a very stable environment. So although you want to be careful and you're always going to make your decision on uh, how difficult that exercise can be based on the control that you're seeing and how well, that, well they're doing it. I wouldn't be uh, scared to do weight bearing exercises with them. You might, obviously, depending on the size of your patient, it might be more suitable to do things against the wall, certainly from the knees. Um, the other thing you can do is I'll sometimes put um, either a small stool or even some pillows if they're gonna do push-ups or something, a stool works better so that they're not working through that huge range of motion. So I think you, I think definitely good question. But again, I, I find the closed chain position to be one of the most uh, beneficial and favorites of patients with instability. That's great. I agree with everything that you just said. Oh, good. Okay, super. Even though it doesn't yeah. matter. Like, you are the master. <laughs> Uh, thoughts on injections, cortisone, prolotherapy, et cetera, are they overused or does it have its place? That's Brandon Powalski. Wow, Brandon, nothing like opening a can of worms with that. Um, okay, so I'm going to tell you, we, we've been involved with um, kind of a consensus process in, uh, well, it's sort of northern Alberta, but uh, and there's been some studies done by some really, really smart people that have looked at how we should be managing in particular rotator cuff problems. And we're probably talking more about um, not, the, not the traumatic, but the atraumatic. And so the consensus for management is that physio is first and foremost. So a patient with a presents with um, generalized sort of shoulder cuff pain should go to physio for six weeks and a very active program. If at six weeks, pain is not managed, so you've not been able to see, not completely gone, but a, a significant reduction in pain, that's when uh, it is recommended that um, we look at other types of um, pain management. It may, may not be an injection, maybe just some oral medication. 
um, but it might be some sort of injection, uh, and then resume physio. And so that's kind of the management that we're at least seeing that's uh, showing evidence from the literature and showing sort of consensus uh, amongst a ton of professionals. So I think it does have a role. Um, uh, it would never be or should never be used um, in isolation. So it should always be used in support of the, you know, the bigger goals, which is always going to be to get the strength and the tissue changed. So what was the other question Brandon had? I forgot. It was such a long question and I gave you such um. a long are they overused or does it have its place? Oh, I think it has its place, but, yeah. but potentially overused. I'll be careful on that. Yeah. Brian has a thumbs up, so he's good. Okay. Phew. <laughs> now we got Kristen Holt. Yeah. Hi, Kristen. Um, and we got a couple of minutes left, so I don't want to, it usually cuts out right in an hour. So okay. try Judy knowing that shoulder surgery tends to have similar successes as rehab with PT. What kinds of things would lead you to refer for surgical cons consultation? Right. So on that same continuum, if you get to 12 weeks and your patient has not changed, then it is definitely worth more investigation. The other thing that we found is if you have someone that has shoulder pain, we have about 80% success with uh, rehab. If we have someone that has significant specific external rotation weakness, um, that is unchanged by that sort of getting into 10, 12 weeks, we know that's a patient that very likely, um, you know, is going to be looking at a surgical intervention. So it seems to be tied to that specific external rotation strength. If you can't change that, then we're probably not the right professional. Great. I'm learning so much. Oh, we got Alexandra. Yeah, I see that. Hi, Alex. Review. Okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> I just wanted to, before it cuts out, I don't want to be rude, but I wanted to thank you, Judy, again. Thank you to you, the faculty, for working so hard for all the current students and, and coming in and doing this with, with us. Um, and yeah, it means the world to me to have you on. And I was, I was pretty excited. I don't think I slept very well last night. Oh, so excited. <laughs> oh Sonny, we got to get you out, buddy. Uh, listen, I, I will tell you, it's been my absolute pleasure. And, yeah. uh, you know, it's been nice to see so many familiar names. I wish everybody well and uh, uh, happy to help out Sunny anytime. Take care, everyone. All the best. You too. Stay safe. Stay good. Yeah, you betcha. You bet. Safe. Soldier on. <laughs> All right. Bye for now. Bye. <laughs>